During the mid to late 2000s, Jeff Ogilvie became one of the premier players in the world after capturing multiple WGC titles and surviving a brutal US Open. Unfortunately, after grinding away and finding less success in the latter decade, the Aussie succumbed to competitive burnout and became less inspired to play PGA Tour golf. Greetings y'all, it's your knock Peter Mata, and today I wanted to talk about Jeff Ogilvie's story, which isn't a complete sad one, but an interesting one nonetheless, because as I just mentioned, it's one that involves competitive burnout, which is not something unusual for golfers or athletes in general, but it's always interesting to me, for players who've had great success like Jeff, to lose the joy and motivation of competing. But anyways, let's get into it now, and look into whatever happened to Jeff Ogilvy. Son to Michael and Judy Ogilvy, Jeff was born in Adelaide, Australia. At an early age, Jeff was already showing promise as he even started hitting balls by the time he reached 18 months old. And by the time he was 7, his dad saw his potential and decided to get him lessons with local pro Henry Cusell, who instantly helped Jeff improve even more. Soon thereafter in his formative years, Jeff would often compete in and win tournaments against older competitors. As a natural athlete, Jeff was also into other sports. Most notably, he was actually a champion runner from 800 to 5,000 meters. He won all schools championships and even represented Victoria as a junior in cross country. However, running didn't engage Jeff like golf did. The tedium of run training bored him and he felt it didn't require the same skill as golf. Also, Jeff at least had an Australian hero to look up to with golf. At 15, he and his dad went to watch Greg Norman win his second Open Championship at Royal St. George's. And from there, that's when Jeff truly knew golf was more his calling. Thus, he pursued it and traveled all around the world as a junior and amateur golfer, winning his fair share of titles along the way. With great success in that arena, Jeff finally decided to turn pro in 1998 and was able to earn a European tour card for the 1999 season on his first try at their qualifying school. In 1999 and 2000, he ended up primarily playing there as well as on the Australian tour. And while he didn't capture any wins, he experienced solid success on both circuits. In Australia, he was named Rookie of the Year on that tour, and on the European tour, he finished 65th and 48th on the Order of Merit in 99 and 2000 respectively. Most notably, he had second place finishes in back-to-back -back years at the Johnny Walker Classic, the second of which was runner-up to Tiger Woods. With those decent seasons building his confidence up, Jeff decided to finally give the PGA Tour a go. Thus, he went to Q School in late 2000. Grinding it out there, he was indeed able to earn his PGA Tour card for the 2001 season on his first try. Again, while he didn't capture any wins, his results in his early years on the PGA Tour were decent. In each of those years from 2001 to 2004, he had several top 10s, some of which include a second and third place. Overall, he finished in the middle of the pack on the money list in each of those years, with his highest finish being 45th in 2003. And now, we finally get to his prime years, the latter part of the 2000s. Starting first in 2005, where Jeff was finally able to capture his first PGA Tour win in a playoff against Kevin Na and Mark Halkovecchia at the Chrysler Classic of Tucson. With the win under his belt, this led to Jeff's best season to that point, as he got his first top 10s in majors with a tied 5th at the Open Championship and a tied 6th at the PGA. And overall, he just missed the Tour Championship by finishing 33rd on the money list. And this turned out to be just the first bit of success Jeff would see in the coming years, as we reach his best year in 2006. Early in that year, he got off to a great start by grinding through and winning all of his matches, including a final one against Davis Love III 
to capture a big time victory at the WGC Accenture match play. With this great momentum, it helped make Jeff battle tested heading into the majors, which he would especially need at that year's grueling US Open. As many of us know, this event was basically the massacre at Wingfoot Part 2. It's been well documented, several premier players squandered chances to close this major championship. Padraig Harrington bogeyed his last three holes to eventually finish two shots back. Tim Furyk just missed his par putt to post five over. Colin Montgomery double bogey from the middle of the fairway after miraculously taking the lead at four over the hole before. And Phil Mickelson infamously let another US Open slip away after hitting a wild drive and making a double to lose by one. It was only our guy Jeff here who made the plays when he needed to. First by amazingly chipping in on 17 for par, then by overcoming a divot filled second shot on 18, by up and downing for par to post five over before Phil came in. And with that wild finish, Jeff became a major champion and only the second Aussie to win the US Open. He also shot up to a new elevated status and rose to the top 10 in the world rankings for the first time in his career. Now he did cool off as far as winning for the rest of 2006 as well as in 2007, but he still played consistent high level golf. He notched a couple more top 10s at the 2006 and 2007 PGAs. He also almost defended at the WGC Accenture match play where he finished runner up to Henrik Stenson. And overall, with the help of a bunch of other top 10s in that time, he finished a career best 5th on the money list in 06 and 13th in the inaugural FedEx Cup playoffs in 07. Jeff also made his first International Presence Cup team in 07, where in a losing effort, he had a pedestrian 2-3-0 record. Nevertheless, the next year in 2008, he continued to build on his good play and was able to knock out his next win. At the WGC CA Championship at Doral, Jeff was able to once again hold off a host of premier players, including Tiger who was on a winning streak, to capture his second WGC and fourth PGA Tour win. Interesting enough, despite that win in a bushel of other top 10s, one of which at the US Open, he ended up missing out on the Tour Championship and only finished 32nd in the FedEx Cup rankings. He did finish the year strong though, as he captured his first Australian Tour win at the Australian PGA Championship, which actually parlayed to more great play in early 2009. At the opening PGA Tour event at Kapalua, Jeff ran away with it and got his fifth PGA Tour win by six shots. For good measure, a couple months later, he again grinded his way out to the finals at the WGC Accenture match play, where he faced Paul Casey and handled business nicely there. With a 4-3 finish, Jeff quickly knocked out his 6th PGA Tour win and his 3rd WGC, which crazy enough, he still actually tied 3rd in amount of WGC wins. Overall that year, with a few other top 10s, he once again finished 13th in the FedEx Cup rankings. He also once again did make the International Presence Cup team, however, his 1-4-0 record contributed to another international loss to the US. Still, Jeff's good streak of play continued to 2010, where he was able to defend at Kapalua and squeak out his 7th win by one shot over Rory Sabatini. Again, this propelled him to have another good season on the PGA Tour, where he finished 14th overall in the FedEx Cup rankings. In addition, he did add another Australian Tour win at the Australian Open to cap off a nice year and a great streak of years. And you know, I distinctly remember thinking around this time that Jeff would not only continue winning, but that he would actually continue adding to his major count. However, that would not be the case. In the next few seasons, he would actually enter into a winning drought. And in fact, from then until now, he's only recorded one more professional win around the world. So I think this would be a good time to dig deeper into that title question and see what this past decade has looked like for Jeff 
and why we rarely see him competing out there anymore. So first, getting into his 2011 and 2012 years, which really weren't bad, he just didn't capture any victories. In total, he still had consistent results with 19 top 25s that included 5 top 10s in that time span, two of which were in majors at the 2011 Masters and 2012 Open Championship. And overall, he still finished 24th and 47th respectively in the FedEx Cup rankings in those years. And again, despite another international loss, Jeff did earn himself a spot on the President's Cup team where he at least had himself a good showing in Melbourne with a 3-1-1 one one record. After that though, he did fall into a bit of an 18-month slump where he later said caused him to change his approach. In 2013, he only had one top 10, he missed more cuts than he made, and overall he finished 104th in the FedEx Cup rankings. And really, until the 2014 Barracuda Championship, this type of play continued as he didn't record a single top 10 in those first 7 months of that year. But give credit where credit is due, with the change of approach, Jeff was able to turn 2014 into a successful year. He was able to capture his first win in 4 years at that Barracuda Championship, taking good advantage of the stable forward format. As Jeff explained, the struggles had caused him to work even harder in the gym, on the range, with Trackman, etc. But this approach actually didn't work for him. And in fact, he found that less practice and more competitive practice rounds were the keys to how he got his game sharp enough to win again. So pretty interesting perspective there. And as I said, this win helped turn around his season that eventually saw him finish 29th in the FedEx Cup rankings. However, as I also mentioned earlier, to this point, this has been Jeff's last win. In those following PGA Tour seasons, from 2015 to 2018, he would only record a total of three top tens and make the FedEx Cup playoffs only once in that time span. And we haven't seen Jeff on the PGA Tour since 2018. Now he did activate his European Tour status for 2019, but he's only played in four events on that tour since then. I do know he's scheduled to be playing in Australia pretty soon, so I guess look out for him there. But yeah, there are probably a few factors that should be mentioned for Jeff's struggles in this latter part of the 2010s, and why we really don't see him compete that much anymore, and specifically on the PGA Tour. For one, looking at the stats, it looks like there was a bit of a drop off all around, and especially in his strokes game putting. In his peak years, he'd often rank somewhere in the 20s, but in his bad years, it looks like it balloons to the 170s. So clearly, there was a bit of a loss in form as he aged, which is natural. Also, looking specifically into some of the things Jeff has said, it does go a bit deeper. One thing is that Jeff got to the point in his life where he just wanted to spend more time with his family. Not that he didn't like competing, but he just wanted more balance and didn't want to play a full schedule anymore. Additionally, he and his family made a big move back to his home country, Australia, in 2018. He had been wanting to go back for a while to where he grew up, and he wanted his kids to share that similar experience. And also with that, his mind has been focused on other parts of golf besides playing. Jeff is known as one of the more knowledgeable players out there, and one particular interest he's developed has been in course design and golf development. He specifically partnered up with OCCM Golf, which is an architecture business based in Melbourne. With them, they work together on course design, course restoration, and golf development specifically in the Sandbelt region. In 2021, in fact, Jeff and OCCM Golf have helped create a unique tournament based in Melbourne for a mix of men and women amateurs and pros to participate in. The Sandbelt Invitational later this month will feature four rounds of tournament golf at four different premier courses in the area. So really cool stuff he's been working on these past few years. And again, it's very natural for a guy in Jeff's shoes who's already accomplished so much playing to once again to other things as he's gotten older. The last factor and probably the most interesting one I'll mention kind of ties into the approach change he had in 2014 
and it even ties to his decision to leave running behind when he was a kid. Similar to how he got bored with running, one of the things is that Jeff grew sort of tired and bored with the typical tour grind, i.e. working out, hitting hundreds of range balls, experimenting with Trackman, and playing long practice rounds with no stakes on the line. The way he got out of that rut in 2014 was by practicing less and by playing more competitive practice rounds. And it did work for the time being, but eventually it again sort of caught back up with him. As Jeff himself put it, quote, I'm served best by reducing my time on the range and playing a lot more. But that's difficult in the US, if only because the practice facilities are so good. The ranges, the putting greens, and the chipping greens are routinely wonderful on tour. And for some people that is great, but that gets my head into my golf swing and out of my shots, if that makes sense. Another big thing that made Jeff disinterested, specifically from competing on the PGA Tour, was the courses and their setup. As he said, quote, I definitely got a bit jaded. The typical US tour setup is very similar every week. It's an incredible tour, but it just didn't inspire me anymore. I wasn't getting excited to see these golf courses. And the practice rounds don't help. It is frightening how long they can take. It can take six hours to play 18 holes on a Tuesday, which is tedious. What used to be great fun just isn't anymore. Every now and then, you get some really amazing ones on that tour, but generally the setups I didn't really enjoy. An added bonus to being here in Australia is being able to come and play more tournaments on courses that I enjoy. So clearly, Jeff was pretty burned out from competing on the PGA Tour in this latter part of the 2010s, which I suppose is pretty understandable and an interesting take nonetheless. And I also suppose kudos to him for doing something about it and going elsewhere to a place that'll help inspire him more. So while it doesn't appear Jeff will be hopping into full-time competitive golf anymore, it probably won't be the last we'll see of him. He's still very active in the sport, and with his resume, I'm willing to bet a President's Cup captaincy will be in his near future. So anyways, I wish Jeff the best. He's had a really great career already, and it was fascinating to hear a sort of different perspective as to why we don't see him playing tour golf anymore. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts on him. Were you a big fan of his when he was playing? What do you think of his thoughts on PGA Tour Golf? And overall, what do you think ever happened to Jeff Ogilvy? Thanks again for watching y'all. And as always, please like, subscribe, and comment below. Your words mean something to me. Cobra Speed drivers allow you to hit it long and straight, which helps when you're hitting it into the wind. Thanks, mate. The 2008 Speed Drivers. Longer, straighter, convention busting.